I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where we take the beats of someone's book and we remix it into something spectacular. But if you want the original thing, just go listen to that. Read it. Listen to it on an audiobook. I honestly don't care. But if you want our opinions on these celebrity memoirs, well, baby, you've come to the right place because we're about to opine. And we have a huge announcement today. Today, as of right now, the tickets are live for the last four shows we are doing in 2024. Don't hold me to that word. But as of now, I think we are going to end the Everybody But Bug tour. We've got four cities. We are going to Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, Columbus, and Charlotte, North Carolina. And we are so excited. And we will be in Austin in April. We are so excited to see you guys. I cannot wait to see you live a couple more times before we take a little hiatus, get our heads on straight. And thank you guys so much to everybody who's been coming out to the shows. Vancouver was incredible. LA was incredible. It's the dream of a lifetime to meet you guys. And Claire, if you were to write a memoir, how would you describe last week's chapter? Called out. (laughs) Who called you out? The world. Okay, you guys know I have a really bad habit of thinking I've like come up with an original idea and then very, very quickly and thoroughly being slapped down by the zeitgeist. <laughs> it's happened to me like three or four times this week specifically. I don't ever think I have an original or unique idea. I know other people are doing the ideas, but I didn't realize that I am like the quintessential millennial Northeast Coast idiot. <laughs> Consumer. I'm just so a data set and I see it everywhere. I remember planning my wedding and being like, Oh, I have a wedding that is like every single brand involved is like Brooklyn girl who thinks she's different, but her parents are paying for her wedding brand. (laughs) Like everything about me is so predisposed and preordained. So I've always had this like dream of having chickens. I have a backyard now. And I was like, what if I had chickens back there? (laughs) And I've been looking up to it and it's so legal. Nobody could stop me. And I actually live a couple blocks away from these people who have chickens in their front yard. And I was just like, How fucking phenomenal would it be if I had these chickens back there and I could give all of my friends fresh eggs and I feel like people would be happy to come help take care of the chickens when I'm on vacation because for the price of fresh eggs in this economy, yes, please. Mac is allergic to animals. We can't really have pets, but I'm like, how fun would that be if my kids grew up with chickens? And also how funny would it be if because of our chickens and the chickens a few blocks away, my kids like thought that was just like such a normal thing to have in New York City. I'd also like to have Bug take care of the chickens sometimes. Bug cannot go near the chickens. The chickens will beat the shit out of Bug. Those chickens will establish dominance so fast. I've also come up with so many funny names for the chickens. I'm really excited. And to then them. Ashley sent me this screenshot the other day of TikTok. And somebody had done this video being like, what's the millennial midlife crisis breakdown moment? Like, are we getting sports cars still or what are we doing? And somebody goes, oh, it's homesteading. We're all getting chickens now. And I was like, huh? Am I having a breakdown? Am I in the middle of my life? Am I not going to make it past 62? Am I in crisis? And I didn't even, I thought it was a great idea. You're having a mental breakdown. You just love chickens. I'm so prepared. I've like canvassed the internet to find the best priced chicken coop and like what's a good amount of space for them. There's these little bars that they sit on so that they don't get cold in the winter. Did you know chickens only really lose body heat through their feet? So if you keep their, you get them little chicken socks and they're good to go. I mean, I'm so prepped for these chickens. I'm prepared to start composting so that my chickens have a sweet treat on Friday. And I cannot believe that I am just one of millions as I always am. I still think you can make an egg if you want to. Listen, I'm not going to not do it. One thing I'm not afraid of is being the average. I've made a career out of saying the thing that a lot of people are thinking, okay? I don't fear it. I respect it. And I admire myself for being dead center. Someone's got to be under that bell curve and statistically is most of us. And I'm happy to be with the people. How could it be wrong if 10 million people think it, you know? I've said it once and I've said it a million times. I love to be a salmon. That's why I love moshing. I love to like move with a flow. That's why I'm jealous of pigeons. You ever see a pigeon by itself? Of course not. It's always with friends. (laughs) <laughs> if everyone likes one thing, it must be the best thing. <laughs> you going to tell me Uggs aren't great? Of course you are because you're a hack. But the rest of us just leaned in. <laughs> we got our Uggs and our shaken espressos and our wellness journey. I'm wearing taupe colored Birkenstocks right now. When I wear my Uggs out to my backyard to get my chicken eggs, you'll be sorry. Ashley, if you were a celebrity and you had a memoir, what would this week's chapter be called? Um, You can buy chickens to return to your roots, but I've done it not by choice. I've been forced into the dark ages and I'm liking it. You got to give the people a little bit of something. 
That's the title. My oh my phone- god. <laughs> I woke up this morning and I found that my phone just is simply gone. It won't turn on. It's just a black screen. I can't believe it killed itself. It just, my phone took itself to the grave. It Harry carried. It was like humiliated for you. You were working it hours that it couldn't handle anymore. It said your screen time is disgusting and I'm not doing this anymore. It's too much for me. So it's gone. And do you know what I did instead of trying to figure out what happened? I just let it be. I said, I'm going to take Bug for a walk and address this later. And then I made an appointment at the Apple store for tomorrow. But really, I'm just kind of like, I don't know. Maybe I'm done with phones. Off the grid, living off my chickens. I mean, I know I'm not. I know it'll just be like a nice vacation that I'll dream about. Sometimes I'll always say, do you remember that week where I had no phone? That was nice. I mean, we're looking at maybe 36 hours. And I kind of like it. I haven't really known what's going on. And I feel like Even just one morning off my phone, I feel like I got to the studio and I have my laptop with me, of course, but I didn't even rush to open my computer to see if I got any texts. I said, listen, we're hanging out. You were talking to a neighbor when I got here. I was. That's what happens when you get off your goddamn phone. You meet your fucking neighbors and you make a new friend. Single gals, get off your phone. That's so true. You want to meet people? Have you ever tried looking around? (laughs) That's so true. All I needed to do was not look at my phone when I'm walking. Sometimes I think of the walk like from the train to the studio as phone time. I go, Ashley, if you read on the train, you can have phone time while you walk. But what if I just walked? Sometimes I hear the way we talk about our phones and it's like so clear to me the addiction. Oh, it's the such way an you just said phone time. Like everything we do here, like we're living our dreams technically this minute. Yeah. But really what our dreams are is phone time. What is the least amount of hours I could work to make the most money so that I could be with my phone later? I was thinking about how many plans I could make this week if I just plan carefully because I don't actually need one hour between everything I do to look at my phone more. If there is no phone, then I don't need to schedule time around staring into my phone. I'm feeling so repulsed by us. I'm not because I'm free. (laughs) Anyway, should we get into this week's memoirist? Speaking of working hard, keeping your nose to the grind and not to the phone. Juicy J and the Chronicles of the Juice Man. I'm still recovering from the mirror that's been held up to me. (laughs) Juicy J is currently 48 years old and was born April 5th, 1975. And this book came out last year. February 2008, Holmby Hills, California. How hard is the L in that? Holmby? I think it's quite a hard L. Holmby. Holmby. Not Holmby. I think they'd say if you're not in a tax bracket to know whether the L is silent or not, then you can't say it. It's Humble Hill, (laughs) where the people are so humble. So it starts at a party in Holmby Hills where he is high as a motherfucker. That's the first line. I was high as a motherfucker. As I was stumbling through this party, I looked around. People were over there. Cocaine was over here. I guess I don't know that this book needed to start out with like record scratch. How did we get here? I'm a rapper at a party. (laughs) (laughs) I bet you're wondering how me, Juicy J of 36 Mafia, ended up in Los Angeles surrounded by cotton candy flavored cocaine. No, I actually like assumed that that was the goal the whole time. What's more surprising is that you hate cocaine. Yes. And I will say that's something I love about him. But I was confused about the timeline, I guess, because of his time as a solo artist. I think of Juicy J and 36 Mafia as more recent, but they are kind of OGs of their genre of music. The Ogs, I call him. So when he says we were two years past winning an Oscar and I was at a party and I walked past Britney Spears, I was like, what year is this that Britney Spears was still allowed to be at a party? 2008. A bad, bad time. A bad, bad time. (laughs) Can I say? What? Okay, please cut this out, Emily. I don't know why I had to shut everything down to say this. Mogs. Memphis OGs. Mogs. (laughs) <laughs> Emily, please keep this in. <laughs> okay. Sorry, that was just stuck in my head. It was like a bird in the airport in there. <laughs> I had to let it be free or I couldn't have moved on with my day. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was doing the same thing every day, just waking up and getting high. That was it. Everything was suffering. So he was big on Xanax and alcohol. Those were his like major vices. I think he did some other drugs. He loved lean, Vicodin, and like the pill popping range. Yeah. If you could drink it or you could eat it. Yeah. He would try it probably. But suddenly he looked around and was just like repulsed. He said everywhere where there were girls just making out, having sex, there was bars in the closet and he just was standing on a balcony. Then it hit me. What am I doing with my life? 
I was doing the same thing every day, just waking up and getting high. That was it. So I gathered myself and called the girl I was seeing at the time. I'm done with this shit. I told her, I need you to come and pick me up before I kill myself. What? She replied. <laughs> I'm not feeling good. This ain't me. This really ain't where I want my life to end. So he decides he needs to move back to Memphis and get his head on straight. Los Angeles was driving him crazy. So chapter one, back against the wall. Something I'd like to note about this book up top is the um, formatting of the chapters. I need somebody to send me an Excel spreadsheet of every single rapper and the number of pages in their book. I guess you know who we have to look up right now. Who? Gucci Mane. We actually could. I know. He does this thing where every chapter has a title page that says chapter one. So it goes chapter one page. And then there's a second title page called Back Against the Wall. And then there's a third page where the chapter starts. And to put two full pages, two full essentially blank pages before every chapter begins makes me ask, what page number were you trying to hit and why? Without acknowledgments, it's 277. What's Gucci's? 270. I wonder if he was trying to beat Gucci Mane. I bet he had 268 pages or something. And he goes, if we add two pages per chapter, that's 15 more. Like, that makes sense, right? I mean, there was something happening here stylistically. <laughs> It was a nice little uh, breath every time you get to the end of a chapter, though. <laughs> I liked knowing that I was going to fly through because half of the pages were empty. Do you know another thing I noticed about this book? What? Every chapter ends with such a cliffhanger. Every chapter ends with, and I had no idea how much crazier it was going to get, or things were about to get really good for me, or things could only go downhill from here. This was written with such intent. Yes. And by that, I mean, like, there's a Juicy J that he wants to put out there, and I fell for it. And then I marinated on it. And I have some things to say. Yeah, I do think that he is a thoughtful and intentional person because this book was clearly written with a lot of thought and intent in the way that he portrayed himself. It definitely doesn't make him seem fun and interesting. He comes across like such a good guy in this book. You gotta wonder if you are one of the hoes he was poking. Okay, well, I guess I did fall for it. What do you mean he might not be good? <laughs> I'm kidding. Kind in a way. <laughs> I guess I do think that he seems like someone who means well and has gotten caught up in shit. And he says that about himself. He takes a lot of accountability. I do think he glosses over the women in his life that have come and gone that are treated like shit. You don't even notice how badly the women are being treated because they're not even characters. They're like gas stations that you're filling up at. Nobody has ever been like, you weren't even kind to that gas station. <laughs> From a business perspective, it seems he's always been kind and fair and not sexist. Like he worked with a lot of women. He was excited to elevate female voices in music and he made sure they got paid. But he also is really disrespectful, I think. Well, there's women he respects and then there's women he fucks and they're often not the same until one. It starts off like this. Memphis is an evil place. Throughout my childhood, it was overrun with crime and mayhem. People walked around like zombies high on drugs. I felt like Memphis was actually hell. Memphis, however, is also a musical city. So in this chapter, he gives a lot of history of Memphis. He explains a lot of the violence and the history of racism and segregation. Crime seemed to be everywhere and the police were regularly beating up people, especially black men. Yeah, but the music scene got its break because there was an AM radio station based there. And this is something that is just kind of Weirdly interesting to me the way that AM radio stations have played a role in the distribution of interest pockets throughout America. There is a lot of evidence of the way that like AM radio waves have been broadcasted that shoots populations of interest to certain places. What, what's the difference between AM and FM? AM travels farther and it's on like a different frequency than FM. I don't remember the exact science of it, but FM is much more localized and AM broadcasts much further. Okay, cool. So like the Chicago Cubs were on AM radio, so they have fans that go a lot further than Chicago because people could hear the games. And then here he says WDIA was an AM radio station. And after its launch, WDIA became the first radio station programmed entirely for black music. And so the music from Memphis could reach much further, making Memphis kind of a music hub. Interesting. And Stax is one of the most important companies in music history. But by the time I was coming up, it's run with the staple singers, Johnny Taylor, Otis Redding, Isaac Hayes, and the Bar Kays, the Delphonics, the Emotions, the Dramatics, and Booker T, and then MGs were pretty much over. But regardless, there was so much soul in Memphis. So that is something that you have to keep in mind throughout this book. He is obsessed with Stax Records and its legacy. But he grew up hearing all this music all the time. 
and he was really changed by it. I was fascinated by the stories, hearing my parents and other people talk about them. Even though I wasn't around to experience what my parents were talking about, these talks planted a seed. But that's what it was, talk, other people's memories. So when he was growing up, he had an older brother named Pat and then two younger sisters, Carol and Cheryl. He robbed people. Him and Pat would break into people's houses and steal video games and stuff. His mom was a librarian and substitute teacher and his dad was a traveling pastor. It never ceases to amaze me the way that pastor is just a job like bartender. Yeah. I think with bartender, you need to like know more stuff. I think with bartender, there's like less opportunity to cheat on your wife. Yeah. (laughs) Or at least raise a second family somewhere else with all the same names. The amount of celebrities we've read who had traveling pastors as fathers is like one of the most damning pieces of evidence of against organized religion. (laughs) So he worshipped his parents. They were together till they died. Spoiler alert. But they grew up very poor. And he talks about there'd be stretches where they didn't even have anything to eat. And his grandma would have to come over with peanut butter sandwiches. And so he was like, yeah, it was very hard not to get roped into what was happening on the streets because we did have so little. And he's like, I would go into garages and take what I could because we had nothing. So he goes to church. He was really inspired by the music and just the inspirational vibe at church. Prayer has always been a regular part of my life. Today, when my dad calls me over the phone, we have prayer on Sundays. There are a couple of really earnest things in this book that I do believe he sticks by. One is that he's very into prayer. He's always really inspired by religions that permeate cultures. Two is he will never do cocaine. And this is where he got me. So he has two foundational stories that he says like really shaped why he believed in himself and why he got so far. One is through church. He learned about the story about a guy who went to jail for robbing people and then turned his life around. He became a minister right there. I saw that regardless of how you started, you could change your life for the better. And two was... Two was when Len Baez, the basketball player, died. He died from overdosing on cocaine before he got to the NBA after he had been drafted and like seen as the that day and age LeBron James. When he heard about Len Baez, he said, oh, I will never do cocaine. I never did it because I felt like if I did one hit, I would die. Cocaine was around us, though. So this is actually really similar to what happened to me when I was like a freshman in college. I knew someone who died from cocaine and I was just like, oh, I'll just never try it. And this was actually before I'd smoked weed or <laughs> done any drugs ever. Yeah. the I do not trust the morals of the cloistered nun, so to speak. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But I will say he and I are very similar in this way where there's like other stuff that goes on. But for some reason, I guess to me, the fact that cocaine is never taken seriously as a drug, the way people are just like, oh, I just like do some cocaine sometimes. And since that day, I've known personally probably seven to 10 people that have died from cocaine. It does really stress me out when people don't take it seriously as a drug. And he sees it as just like the root of all evil, like all of his friends who were like addicted to heroin. He's like, but if they hadn't done cocaine, things could have been different. And I do think heroin scares me, but I kind of agree. Listen, if you want to do cocaine, that's fine. But the way people think of it as such a casual thing stresses me out to no end. It's not that casual. It's very scary, actually. So he grew up in a place where he saw tons of violence and drug addiction. The junkies weren't worried about ODing. If they saw someone overdose and die from drugs, the junkies would say, that's got to be the good shit. That was the drug they wanted because they knew it was powerful and would deliver a quality high. The first time I ever saw someone die was when I saw a guy get shot seven times in the chest. He has story after story of like the violence he saw. Thankfully, my parents gave us a lot of good principles to live by. However, Pat and I didn't always follow them. So him and his brother get into music and rap. But Pat isn't that serious about it. He's more into street stuff, whereas Juicy J, a.k.a. Jordan, his name is Jordan, but he goes by Juicy J from the time he's like 13. He gets the idea because, first of all, he was obsessed with Jazzy Jeff at the time and what he was doing was scratching records and he wanted to be just like him. But somebody had already taken Jazzy J. And I will say, I think Jazzy Jeff had also already taken Jazzy J. Yeah, that was like kind of just the shortened version of Jazzy Jeff. Jazzy J was taken, but he saw a piece of Juicy Fruit and he goes, Juicy J. <laughs> That's it. So he names himself Juicy J and he gets really into scratching and music and trying to mimic all of Jazzy Jeff's scratches. And he is practicing with just like absolute ragtag equipment. He's like hooking turntables to each other by wires. He was using like literally wire hangers as electronics, as the little needle on a record player. I mean, he was so dedicated. He says, from that point on, I had a hustle mentality. I was a hustle machine. Whenever I'd get my hands on some money, I'd save it or I'd spend it wisely. I saw how people were addicted to things from drugs to money. My addiction was about to kick in too. And I think he's talking about music here. But it's also kind of money. Yeah. He's addicted (laughs) to things too. 
I'd be telling my mom I was going to be a big producer, a big rapper, but she didn't know what the hell I was talking about. After all, she was a librarian. So she does bring him books about music from the library. He asks her to bring home every book about music, and it's like five books. But one of the books is The History of Stax Records. I want to give it a shout out. Soulsville, USA, The Story of Stax Records. So that is what kicks off his obsession with emulating Stax Records, which was an independent record label. He's not just obsessed with making music. He's obsessed with the business of it. And I found it so sweet the way that his librarian mom helped him through books. And I was just like, damn, the library is so important. Use your local library. At the very least, get a library card because that's the best way to support. We would not have 3-6 Mafia if it wasn't for the library. If it wasn't for the library, how could somebody have come up with lyrics like... Bands that make her dance. Yeah. And stay fly. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, slob on my knob. That's poetry. Corn on the cob. <laughs> <laughs> you can't rhyme those if you haven't been influenced by some of the greats. There is no Juicy J without Langston Hughes. <laughs> I think it sounds like I'm being facetious and I'm not. I don't know if you are, but I'm not. I'm a little bit, but I still think obviously the books were important. I mean, he did create a music empire and he was so smart. He did not fall for a lot of the record label shit that most emerging artists fall for because they just think that getting signed to a major label is the most important thing. He didn't fall for it because he had a knowledge of Stax Records from the library. I think both things can be true. I think that that can be very impressive. And I also think we can say slob on my knob, like corn on the cob is not like the most impressive couplet. Agree to disagree. <laughs> corn on the cob. I know there's not a lot of fellas listening to this right now, but that's, I don't know how you're eating corn. Slobby. <laughs> but mine's mostly teeth. <laughs> <laughs> you loosen the kernels with a little bit of slob. <laughs> So he learns about a four-track machine. He'd never heard of one before. And he finds out because his dad is doing some work where he brings him to a recording studio. And he's like, Dad, you have to find out what everything they're using in that studio is. And he learns about the four-track machine where you can record a different sound to each of the four tracks and play them alongside each other. And he was like, I have to get a machine. He ends up buying a used one from his music teacher. He's obsessed with the music of Memphis. Memphis at this point is not seen as like a hip hop or rap hub because it's all coming out of California and New York. And people don't even know the longevity of rap and hip hop at this point. Memphis was developing its own sound. They wouldn't play other artists too much on the local stations. They loved DJ Spanish Fly, Sunny D, DJ BK, Pretty Tony. Overall, his goal is to be a musician, but also to be a producer and an executive. So he always had these huge dreams to be a record label big shot slash musician slash producer. Despite all the obstacles, I wasn't playing games. I didn't write all these raps, go back and forth to all these studios, practice scratching for hours at a time and do all the DJ tricks for nothing. I was in it to win it. But before I could live that dream, I needed to get out of the streets that were trying to pull me under. Bum, bum, bum. I told you every single chapter ends with know, just an well absolute done. cliff. Chapter three. Like many other kids, I tried to sell some weed and rode around in stolen cars with my friends. The basic activities were crime. Yeah. There are certain impulses that he states, quite frankly, but doesn't really dive into the emotions of, which make it seem kind of insane. He hates his neighbor. I hated the kid that lived next door and I wanted to shoot him. Unaware of my ambitions, my mom got me a history of firearms. So he tries to build his own gun so he can kill his neighbor. And this side of him does not come through in this structured and intentional writing of the story of 3-6 Mafia. But I want to know the emotion of the person that decided to build a gun to kill his neighbor. Also, like, he was surrounded by guns. His yeah. brother, Project Pat, was, like, out there often trying to kill people. A lot of the rest of this book is calming down Project Pat so he doesn't kill people. The idea that the best thing for this boy to do would be to build his own gun is an insight into a certain type of person. And then, you know, his homemade gun does not work. I couldn't believe I'd actually tried to shoot this guy. I knew I was acting like a dumb, crazy-ass kid, so I abandoned the mission. Every time I saw him after that, I just walked past him. To go from the impulse where you have to make a gun to kill someone down to, I just had to ignore him. Can I say, everyone should have to make their own gun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start there. Yeah. Oh, you want to kill people? All right, get a book out. I can't even build a dresser from Ikea. I'm <laughs> fucked. <laughs> His parents also really don't believe in him. I felt like they just simply didn't know how good I was. They just didn't get it. They were old and out of touch, but their doubt made me feel like an underdog that no one could see my talent. And he uses that. Throughout his life, he's obsessed with figuring out a way that he's still the underdog. And I think that that's why 
when we meet him in the intro and he's post Oscar at a party, he had lost his sense of self as underdog. His hustle had come from feeling like he needs to prove everybody wrong. It was like a good thing for him to have. So everywhere he goes, though, in the music world, like he's young, but he's constantly getting to studios and meeting new people and being part of the community of DJs and rappers. And everybody's always like, no, 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 you're really good. You're hard is what they always call him. You're hard as fuck is something that people are constantly saying. Also, sometimes cold. Sometimes cold, sometimes hard. Very much like metal. Ice. The big change in his life comes when he goes to his high school principal and asks to DJ the junior high dance. He says yes, and he like kind of bombs it. He insists on scratching the whole time and everybody's like, stop doing that. Play the music. (laughs) But from this gig, he begets new gigs and slowly but surely he figures out how to win the crowd over. And he also starts making mixtapes and he'll sell the mixtapes for $10 and people really liked them. And on the mixtape, he's putting out his own raps. He had something called Criminal Zone. In the Criminal Zone, everybody owns a tone. The Criminal Zone is North Memphis and a tone is a gun. Damn, you're hard, dog. (laughs) That's another... (laughs) Psycho told me he wanted me to DJ for him when he opened for 8-Ball and MJG. So 8-Ball and MJG were big, famous in Memphis. And so when Psycho was opening for them and had him DJ, it was a really big break. And getting on 8-Ball and MJG's radar was a huge deal. He ended up DJing for them later, too. He also puts out a song that gets kind of big in the Memphis area called Don't Be Scared, Put a Rubber on the Head. When I was in 12th grade, I had gotten gonorrhea from this girl, which is why I made the song. (laughs) People love that about him. He was really into protected sex. I genuinely don't believe he has random kids out there. He, to this day, wears two rubbers at a time, which is notoriously the safer way to wear a condom. (laughs) I also get regular checkups to make sure I was okay. People used to know me for that because I talk about it all the time. Listen, that's important to know. I kind of like that he was really into having a clean bill of sexual health and not doing cocaine. I just think that these are not bad qualities. So he puts out, don't be scared, put a rubber on the head and slob on my knob. And like people are loving it. So he starts getting attention as a rapper. The success made me think that I could actually get out of the hood. Growing up with inconsistent food, no room to stretch out and limited money gave me a hustle mentality. It also taught me to save money and to spend it wisely. I decided to put some money in with some friends to buy drugs. (laughs) But the thing is, it is a business investment. So he doesn't have to do any of the selling or the buying. He just like helps invest it from a back end. He just like very private equity vibes. Yeah, he becomes an investor in drugs to get him off the ground. But the problem is he's like, I feel like he's not really like on the streets enough to like be with the people who are good at selling drugs. So the first time he puts in for drugs, they immediately get robbed. So they lose the money and the drugs. And I'm just like, yeah, JCJ, this is not your future. But the thing is, he'll get into these situations And then it just drives him further back into music. So as soon as he'll have a bad business endeavor in drugs and weapons and things like that, he'll be like, actually, never mind. I'll just do more music. And so it lights more fire in his belly. But he like loves political music. He loves that the music he's hearing these raps are talking about things that he's living through. I love the idea that they were actually talking about what was really going on in the neighborhood. Like how easy open boys in the hood by rapping, cruising down the street in my 6'4", jocking the freaks, clocking the dough. I thought political music might help make a change in society. It's something I thought about on a regular basis. And I actually, like, listen, safe sex, baby. He wasn't wrong then and he's not wrong now. They had a message in their songs and would talk about black power, politics, and teaching, which was pretty dope to me. I wanted us to stick together as black men. I had such high hopes that if we all stood together, we could win America. The next paragraph is like, as I said, I wrote slob on my knob in the 11th grade. (laughs) Anyway, so Slob on My Knob goes crazy at a local club and he starts playing it when he DJs and starts really making a name for himself as a DJ in Memphis. Even with these musical breakthroughs, though, I was still hanging out with the wrong crowd sometimes. He gets an Oldsmobile Delta 88. He's just like always with these people that are everyone's kind of hustling each other. And then he has a huge, awful family revelation. Yeah, he finds out his dad has two other daughters in another city and it really breaks his mom down. It sends ripples throughout their family. But his parents stay together. I think it just kind of breaks the trust between him and his dad a bit. Yeah, he thought his dad was this upstanding pastor. Little did he know when he was out doing sermons, he was actually tending to his other family. And it it really puts a lot of doubt in him about his dad. And he says his mom doesn't talk about it a lot and doesn't really show her emotion. But she changed after that. She was just never as happy again. He wrote a diss track about his dad because he felt his dad did not practice what he preached. Pat had to really break things down for me. He explained that our dad was a good dad, that he could have just left us on the street. He could have (laughs) just never come back one day. Our father loved us and took care of us. Pat stressed me. I had to understand that he was our father, but he wasn't perfect. I love that. It could be worse. We could be those daughters he abandoned. (laughs) 
<laughs> or he could abandon all six of us. That's so true. So he's working as a DJ. He's working through his family stuff. His name has started to die down a little bit. He's 21 or 22. And he didn't really know what was next for his career. But he starts teaming up with other rappers and DJs and writers in the area. And he gets introduced to DJ Paul. Paul was from the good side of town, like, or the, like the richer side of town. So he had like a ton of equipment. He just had more money to buy more recording stuff. And they start working together. Paul and I quickly became good friends. In 1993, we started a group called Backyard Posse. Less than a year later, we formed Triple Six Mafia with Paul's nephew, Lord Infamous. Most people think that Paul and Lord are brothers, but they're not. Another fucking nephew, uncle duo, much like MLMFAO and others. Totally. There's at least six out there, I think. Uncle nephew duos? Yeah. The weirdest of all duos. I don't think an uncle and a nephew should know each other, kind of. (laughs) There's something so sick about it to me. There's something a bit sinister about being an uncle. (laughs) And a nephew. (laughs) I like nephews. Yeah, you're all niece-pilled right now. I'm so niece-pilled, but I also think about how Snoop Dogg calls people nephew and how comforting that is to me. Do you guys want to hear my joke I recently came up with? Because Bug is non-binary, I was like, what do I call Bug? Because I don't want to say niece or nephew. (laughs) So I just say nuisance, my little (laughs) nuisance bug. (laughs) She is a nuisance. And Claire, a nuisance bug. (laughs) Don't tell her, she'll jump out a window. The crew ends up growing to 20 people. So Lord Infamous, Juicy J, and DJ Paul. I can't believe DJ Paul couldn't come up with a better name than DJ Paul. I love Lord Infamous. DJ Paul, to me, is your CEO on the company break. I guess DJ Paul is such an uncle. That's my (laughs) uncle, DJ Paul. (laughs) He's going to play my birthday party next week. He has all the songs from Paw Patrol. (laughs) And sometimes he does the voices, too. (laughs) I put the song from Frozen on the Do Not Playlist because that's for babies. (laughs) It's for girls. (laughs) So the Backyard Crew goes to way too many people. And then they form Triple Six Mafia with just DJ Paul, Lord Infamous, Gangsta Boo, Crunchy Black, Koopsta, and I. We got into a good workflow immediately. Can I say something about Lord Infamous, who was very creative and referred to himself as the Scarecrow? What? When he did talk, he'd want to discuss the earth, the moon, the stars, and God. For some reason, he was always drinking milk. Unlike so many people I knew, he wasn't on drugs either. That's me. (laughs) (laughs) Me and Lord Infamous are more alike than we're disalike. I really hope that's not true because he does die from drugs. It starts with milk. And then you start doing powdered milk. (laughs) And then you get a bunch of chickens and the chickens peck you to death. As Paul, Lord, Infamous, and I were developing our relationship, I was feeling pressure from what seemed like everywhere. I wanted to escape the evil, escape the streets, and stop having to deal with bony-ass people and make a better way for myself. So in 1993, I made a mixtape called Escape from Hell. It had several meetings. The other Triple Six Mafia members talked about hell so much, it felt like I was already living in hell in North Memphis. So also in Three Six Mafia, I think she said it, but I want to emphasize that Project Pat is his older brother, Patrick. But people didn't know that they were brothers. And he didn't like people to know that they were brothers because he didn't like people knowing any of his personal business. He didn't like anyone knowing where he lived. He didn't like anyone knowing who he was related to. It was mostly actually a safety measure because people were just shooting people all the time. So they have these beefs. Pat almost has to kill someone for Juicy J, but then they stop each other. I mean, Pat would kill anybody he could get his hands on, I think. Pat is like happy to kill someone for you. But Juicy J is happy to not have killed anyone. And so he puts his emotions back into his beats. I was really big on experimentation and trying different things. Every time I made a beat, I would change something. Maybe the snare. I would bring a dark beat. Then I'd grab a sample from some bright ass sound. I would sample a song from a soul artist. But I would put a street hook on the song. We wanted to get money, not start fights. I was always trying to think long range. So they end up having to change Triple Six Mafia because the Triple Six made people too scared. Everyone thought they were demon worshippers, Satan worshippers. So they changed it to Three Six Mafia, which didn't sound as Satan-y. People thought it was like 36 Mafia. They also were like, we used to be three and now we are six. And in that sense, we're a mafia of growth. Yeah. We're a growth mafia. Then he gets a phone call about Pat. His mom calls him. It didn't matter what I was doing. Having sex, recording a song. If my mom called, I answered. Things were so bad in Memphis, I always wanted to be there in case she needed me, and she finds out that Pat was arrested. We called it a family alert. When we got one of those, we went home quickly. It's so cute. (laughs) 
Pat had smoked some angel dust with one of his coworkers and robbed a store in the mall of Memphis. Dang. Angel dust, I think, will do that to you. Yeah, I think you rob when you do angel dust. He says it changed Pat, though. It's like Pat went from giving a damn to not giving a fuck about anyone or anything. I felt like he was ready to go to war with everybody. It was outrageous. The neighborhood had taken Pat over. Meanwhile, music stuff in Memphis is starting to spread out a bit. 8-Ball and MJG have built a significant buzz, so they signed to a record label in Houston, but he ended up staying in Memphis. When 8-Ball was back in town, he wanted to put them in touch, but they decided to do things a little bit differently. They weren't ready to sign with like a label label. I had been dreaming of breaking through like 8-Ball and MJG had. They'd signed to a label and were doing it bigger than anyone else I knew. 3-6 Mafia was about to join them. So everyone in 3-6 Mafia is putting out these mixtapes. They're putting out 3-6 Mafia mixtapes, but they're also individually and hopping on each other's mixtapes. They're putting out just a ton of music. And we're living good off the mixtapes. We were acting as our own record company, as well as our own distributor. But then they meet this company called Selecto Hits, and Selecto Hits is an independent distributor that will sign them just to distribute in a broader region than they're able to physically sell mixtapes out of their car. But they keep the publishing and everything. And because he's read this book about Stax Records and he understands what it means to sign over your publishing, they're really excited to have this deal where they maintain ownership of all of their music. And they get like 90% of the cut. Yeah. I mean, it's a really great deal. As I would later find out, it was rare for a successful person in the music industry to let you run your own ship and retain complete control of your music. So they got a good deal from these guys. And he works with them till the end. He really appreciates. To this day, I think they're still working together. The decency of it all. Our music was popular, but I knew people in other cities were hearing it too. So they dropped this album called Mystic Styles with Selecto hits, and it's doing numbers. And he starts making like smart decisions. He sells his fancy car for $3,000 and buys a cheaper one. A lot of people in my neighborhood thought I was going broke, but I didn't give a fuck. I had to make the right business decision. People started talking shit about me, saying I was weird. I didn't fuck with them. They were right. I didn't. And he starts being like, how do I put everything back into this business? So he's running this business and he is the accountant. He's like the head of the collective of the business. He's making sure all the contracts are right. He's signing it for everybody. And he knows you got to read all of your contracts. And he's big on treating everybody well. And he has everybody signing contracts. So even though everyone's just like hopping on each other's music and making mixtapes and everything, the collective is very by the book. So Bone Thugs and Harmony are kind of getting big, and so are Biggie. Now, I'm not saying Biggie took anything from me, but I felt like he did. He kind of implies that... Because he was going by the Notorious Juicy J, and he feels that the Notorious B.I.G. was a bit of a ripoff. Because of the distribution with Selecto hits, Mystic Styles ends up hitting the Billboard charts, and he didn't even know what the Billboard charts were at that point. We tried to get a label to sign us, but nobody was interested. So they start like running around trying to see who they can connect with. And they come up with this great idea that he gets from the Stax Records book of in order to break into other markets to do like mixtapes and live performances with other bands in their city. So like go to Chicago and get who's big on Chicago and like perform with them. And then that way you break into their fan base, which is what we do with podcasting. <laughs> yeah. I loved doing everything because I felt like I was looking out for the team, but there were risks operating like this, which I also thought about. There were a lot of beefs. There was just like a lot going on. And because he's kind of writing this book as a history of Juicy J, but also including the entire lore of 3-6 Mafia, there are like a lot of open threads that are a lot to keep track of. They had kind of a beef with Bone Thugs and Harmony, but it got resolved. We'd hear that people were dissing us and we'd listen to the tapes to try to figure out the voices we didn't know. We felt like those people we had to watch out for. They have all these beefs and they're trying to figure out if someone's going to try to kill them or if it's just to get attention because 3-6 Mafia was blowing up. So if you diss 3-6 Mafia, that's another way to get attention on your mixtape. I was really ready to go to war and it wasn't in my character. So this one guy play a fly pushed him to the limit and he is like ready to kill him. He starts sleeping with a bulletproof vest on because of this beef. I mean, something interesting that he says is different today than it used to be is that people used to like try to work out their problems. And now everybody takes to killing so quickly, which I find interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't. That's his perspective. I, I'm interested to hear other people's perspectives. I was interested in the way he was like, we would listen and try to figure out like, who is in these people's ears? Do we really have a problem with these people? Or are they just like making noise for the attention? Yeah. And that's something that he keeps his whole life. He's always like, I don't know if this person is dissing me because they're actually mad at me and we're actually going to fight. Or if they just know that by saying my name, everybody is elevated. And he's like kind of okay with that. He understands the game of the music industry and the game of like a rap battle. Yeah. The other thing is that he is constantly prepared for a gunfight. He's strapped to this day, dropping off his kids at preschool, just like, just in case. 
he's like very careful to not be around drugs when he doesn't have to be. He doesn't like being around drugs. He doesn't like risking the idea of being caught with drugs because he doesn't like doing most drugs. Yeah, he says that like if he's in a car with somebody who has enough drugs that if they get pulled over, it'll be possession and like intent to distribute. He will not drive with them. But he's like, but you got to drive with guns because that's life or death. Yeah, that's his exception. He's like, you had to have guns, but you shouldn't have drugs. So Play a Fly is like just causing trouble all the time. He's a guy in the Memphis scene and he ends up getting in Gangsta Black's ear and convincing him to have a problem with the group. And they end up just buying him out of 3-6 Mafia. They're like, just you're causing too much trouble. That's how we dealt with our artists who had issues. If we couldn't resolve the issue or if things got too petty, we swallowed our pride and let them go. And so they're constantly just buying people out of their contracts because they're like, I don't know, man, if you're going to be annoying, we're not doing this. He also has such foresight and belief in himself that he's like a couple hundred grand now is gonna be worth millions in the future i'd rather not have to deal with you and let you tank us and it's a mistake people make time and time again and i commend his confidence and his foresight he talks about how the whole collective all of three six mafia was getting really into drugs especially as they got more money they'd get crazy high and pop pills too they'd be slurring their words that wasn't my style my style was women if anything i had a sex addiction i'd have three or four chicks with me women loved me because i was hood but i could turn it off and on so this isn't something he really dives into he just kind of mentions it throughout the book as it's necessary that he had sex with a lot of women and didn't respect any of them yeah he's also very anti yes man he's like i will always be honest with people and i expect people to be honest with me I guess I really understand why he had a ton of beefs, but it translated to making good music. He was never going to tell someone that their track was good if it wasn't. So that led to 3-6 Mafia putting out incredible music. They had a record label that they were putting out music under called Profit Entertainment. I told everyone in the crew, if you see me doing anything bizarre that doesn't look right, please tell me. I'm going to listen. I'll be coming to you as a friend, a brother, somebody that actually cares about you. And he says, if you're ever in a point where somebody's like, oh yeah, let's do that drug, they don't care about you. The person who cares about you is going to be the one that's like, let's not. Yeah. That's why I was telling him not to do drugs, not to do cocaine, because I felt like it was really destroying the group. I didn't mind them smoking weed, popping pills, or downing some syrup, but every time they got on cocaine, they would get tough and act crazy. We were still young, so our issues weren't that deep. If we were at a show and fighting backstage, all it would take was for the promoter to tell us we were going on in five minutes. Almost immediately, the tension evaporated. So they start doing more and more shows because they're using this method of like breaking into areas, using shows with other performers. They didn't have the internet, so they had to physically go places in order to get there. But they didn't always go smoothly. We'd often have to think off the top of our heads to make sure things worked. If we did a show and Boo didn't show up, which happened all too often, I'd tell the chat to pretend she was Boo and to perform her parts in the song. I also told chat that if people tried to do an interview with her to turn it down and not talk to anyone. People didn't really know what we looked like, so it worked. (laughs) But they all started missing shows. So they would start taping different versions of the backing tracks so that whoever didn't show up, they had a version ready to go without their verse on it, which is interesting. And then they start putting out albums. If it did well on a mixtape or one of the underground albums, it needed to be on a CD, one of our national releases so that people outside of Memphis could hear us. That happened with hits like Tear the Club Up. It was on one of DJ Paul and Lord Infamous's mixtapes, and then they redid it and added me to the song and put it on Mystic Styles in 1995. So a lot of the songs, including Slob on My Knob, that was on like a handful of mixtapes and a couple CDs. Yeah, I love that. If something's working, I mean, Britney Spears. That's something that we need to do better. I feel like we're like, well, we already said that 10 years ago. So what are we going to say it again? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, we had 400 listeners. We could try it a second time. The radar method, baby. Britney Spears made a mixtape and then she made an album. I love that. So then they start getting some interest from a major label. They have some interest from, which one do they sign with? They go with Relativity Records. Yes. It's so funny. They have such great business at the beginning. And then as they get bigger and bigger, things fall apart. So they work with these guys, Cliff and Allen. And what I liked about Cliff and Allen was that they didn't try to take or buy our music publishing. That was unlike every other label we'd spoken to. That's how the music industry was set up at the time. And I didn't like that because I thought the labels were just being greedy. They wanted to have you as an artist and your publishing. The industry was big on finessing artists. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't just try either. They did a great job at it. I never wanted to sell my publishing. Even then, I was thinking my publishing would feed me when I was old. That is so smart. I feel like we even have that issue where people will just come in and be like, oh my God, this thing that you already built, we would love to take a chip of it and not add anything else. Ironically, we just like had to turn down a contract with a music company. Because they did that. Because I was like, (laughs) oh my God, what you think we should give you is insane. And like, it seems that there's no part of you that thinks you should make what you're doing for us more valuable and therefore make more money. You're just like, well, give me a piece of everything. And yeah, and you can put our name on your thing to make it look like you guys do less. Nice try, bitch. (laughs) 
Okay, so the Tear the Club Up 97 video comes out and everyone is into them now. Three Six Mafia starts blowing up. Southern rap as a whole is not being taken seriously. So they're coming out of like left field, even though he's like Outkast and Goody Mob are major actors. Master P and UGK. Without knowing it, we help popularize chant music. Some people call it get buck music or crunk music. Regardless, Memphis artists happen to write their choruses in a way where you could easily like chant it with a crowd. And he calls it fight music. He's like, people fought in the club, so we made music to fight to. Songs like Blow Yo Ass Off, Tear the Club Up, Get Buck Motherfucker. <laughs> they would have to sign contracts promising not to say Tear the Club Up at clubs because the clubs were getting torn up, if you can believe it. <laughs> and they're like, we never listened. I was like, Jesus Christ, I would hate to be a bottle girl at a club. People were just like ripping chairs out of the ground and throwing them. So then some of their friends are moving to Atlanta and they think that moving to Atlanta could be the next big step. But they really sit down and think about it and say, you know what? We can really represent Memphis if we stay in Memphis for a while longer. Plus, because his big dream is to become Stax Records, he's like, well, Stax Records was in Memphis. So they go gold with world domination. Chapter two, world domination. I liked going gold, but I didn't always like the overall experience of being signed to a major label. Relativity treat us like royalty, but in the back of my mind, I always felt like I was being controlled in some way. So they start getting a lot more meetings. They start getting taken more seriously by industry. When people would meet us, they'd be like, when I first heard your music, I thought you were devil worshipers. I thought I'd walk into the studio and see you doing a ritual with a cross or a Ouija board, and I'd have to run out. Now that I've met you, you're actually cool and smart and not as crazy as I thought you'd be. After people spent time with us, they'd walk away knowing that we were smart and serious. I kind of think that that's us. Not like the I don't know devil worshipers. Us. But I think people think we're such idiots. And then sometimes they have a conversation with us and they go, oh, you're smart and you're doing a business. Can I say? Not always. I have yet to have that conversation with us. <laughs> I'm waiting for the day, I think. Huh? We're pretty good at this. <laughs> when people saw what we were doing, putting things out on a major label through Relativity, but then still dropping our independent albums via Selecto hits, they couldn't believe it. We were making a lot of money. A couple million here, a couple million there. Money was rolling in real fast. So the Three Six Mafia music is with Relativity, but all of their independent work is with Selecto Hits, and they're so rich. <laughs> we wanted to do as much as we could to remove egos. Paul and I didn't want to push for a single because one of us did it. We wanted to only be concerned with picking the best songs. They were really careful about splitting up the albums five and five, so Juicy J produced half, DJ Paul produced half, and they tried to be as objective as possible about promoting the best work. And it seems like everybody else is like the best rappers. Like Lord Infamous was huge. Gangsta Boo, people loved. It seemed like they were like great on the songs, but really did not show up or put in any legwork. The collective was being run by Paul and Juicy. I was the first one in the studio every day, usually there at 7 a.m. I was ready to go. Paul would come in at 5 or 6 p.m. because he'd been up all night and would stay until I arrived the next morning. Paul and I were often the only ones in the studios other than the engineer and someone working the phones for us. And he's like, but then when other people would come, I didn't even like to stay because they'd bring a hundred people. They bring an entourage. They'd bring so many drugs and people would just be acting insane and bringing guns. And it was just like violent and crazy. He kind of comes to the realization that everyone in the group hates each other. There was a lot of beef because Lord Infamous was really upset because originally it had been him and Paul. I totally forgot that Lord and him were also related. Have that disgusting bond <laughs> of nephew and uncle. <laughs> So Lord is really upset that he's not a part owner of 3-6 Mafia. There's a third silent partner, but it's mainly Juicy J and DJ Paul. And Lord is upset that he's not kind of an owner of the top line. But Juicy J is like, well, he's not doing work for the top line. Like he's doing his work as a member of the collective, but he's not running shit. So he shouldn't make money for running anything. That makes no sense. And it becomes a huge rift between them. Everybody had egos. I had one. Everybody thought they were doing shit and had their own way that they wanted to do things. Even if someone rapped better than me in the group, I didn't care. I still thought I was better than them. Like he does admit that he had a major ego about it all too, but he actually was doing the work it seems. But also this is his side of the story. So I don't know. So he starts making tons of rules in the studio because he's putting in all the work and it just pisses everybody off. He puts up a sign on the door that says no dope dealers, no bank robbers, no phones, no sisters, no friends. And everyone's like, what the fuck? He also says no guns are allowed at the studio. Because, you know, if one person starts shooting, everyone's shooting. He starts fining people if they're late. And everyone's just mad at him all the time because it seems like he's kind of a bitch. But also he's getting work done and making them a ton of money. Too much was at stake. One day DJ Paul and I said, new rules. We're getting nobody out of jail. If you go to jail, you stay in jail. Oh, they're also constantly bailing the guys out of jail. 
Then Nick Jackson, their silent partner, is like, I want to make an album. And they're like, shut the fuck up, Nick Jackson. You suck. He was just like this giant drug dealer in Memphis who owned a third of it. And he could have made millions if he had just shut his stupid mouth. But he went to jail and he comes out and he decides he wants to be a rapper now. They go to court and fully they have to buy him out. They do it all by the law. And then later he came out and was like, you owe me more money. And then he had to admit that like they didn't. They paid him fair and square. They originally paid him out by the contract. And then he took them to court. And the court was like, yeah, they bought you out of your contract fair and square. He'd probably realized that he'd walked away from hundreds of millions of dollars, big success and opportunity. Is it hundreds of millions? Is Juicy J worth hundreds of millions? Probably. We went back to court and the judge ruled that he couldn't just change his mind. The judge ruled in our favor because the deal was done fairly and properly. The one thing that he takes a lot of pride in and I give him a lot of credit for is he does everything fairly. He doesn't care if you've reneged on your end of the contract. He'll pay you out so that it's like done and dusted and you have to move on. And you have to spend the rest of your life being like, I didn't show up for my studio time. I got paid and I can't even complain because now the song that I was supposed to be on went triple platinum, but I have no stake to it. Because he has so much belief in himself. He's like, I can give you $400,000 today and it won't make a difference because I will be worth hundreds of million dollars later. His beef with Nick, I feel like they probably never talked to God after they bought him out and then went to court with him. And Nick died in 2015 and he goes... He got his money and that was it. Nick passed away in August 2015, RIP. The way that like when he has a beef with someone, he's so methodical about being like, yeah, we hate each other. The end. And I kind of like that. Whenever someone he hates dies, he's just like, "Uh, I didn't wish death upon him, but I didn't wish a good life either. (laughs) After the success of Chapter 2 World Domination, we had no intentions of slowing down. Debut solo albums from Indo G and Gangsta Boo were up next. But as I had seen with the limo situation, Boo was hard to deal with. So Boo had run up their bill with the studio with Relativity Records by taking a limo all around New York City. Just as he had that problem with the other two people, now this is the beginning of his problem with Boo and that she wanted to be treated like a star. She really wanted to be turned into the next little Kim. And he's like, she could have in the sense that she was talented enough and people did love her music and love her raps, but it just wasn't going to work. It seems like... Because he kind of operated as bumpers for everybody, like he did his best to keep everybody on the rails. They all really relied on him to be that. Like no one was functioning that well without him, but it's also kind of hard to tell because obviously this is his side of the story. It also is hard to read this book sometimes. And I think it's well written in some ways in that it's very thoughtful. There's a clear narrative. There's a clear perspective. He wants to be redeemed and he wants to take accountability. And he's very reasonable in being like, this is what I did wrong. This is what they did wrong. This is how I try to rectify it. This is what I regret. This is how I've changed, blah, 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 blah. But something that actually makes this book hard to follow, I guess, unless you're like a big time 3-6 Mafia fan and very familiar with all the ins and outs. And it's not just a band. It's a collective, which makes it very confusing. Yeah, because there's the members of 3-6 Mafia, which great. But then there's also the other people who are part. Like they're also putting out music for Project Pat, for Indo G, for there's so many people who just kind of get brought in and brought out and you can't tell until the end of the book who is actually important. So some of these asides into recording someone's solo project are so deeply unimportant. And he very much gets in the weeds sometimes I feel with being like, and this is how many numbers Zindo G's did. At the same time, this was going out on this label and then these people were producing this. And it's just like, it's hard to remember what you're talking about. So anyway, things are going bad in the group. The bigger they get, the more it's getting bad. The more people are doing drugs, the more money they have, the more they're going to jail, the more he's bailing them out, the more he's getting angry, the more he won't bail them out anymore, the more that they're resentful of his success and the fact that they feel he's blocking him from their band, not band, collective. The problem is because DJ Paul and Juicy J are in charge of everything, they're making a lot of money and they're making a lot of decisions. But also when left to their own devices, no one else even shows up. So it's like I said, from his side of the story, I'm like, I see you're totally right. But also, I wonder if there is another side to the story. Yeah. And so like, here's a story about him and Koopsta getting into a physical brawl where like Koopsta would go off and do music for somebody else and like diss 36 Mafia, which is the collective he's in. And so now they're at the backstage and Juicy J is like beating him up. And again, it's all of these stories that like, I can't tell how important they are. I feel like I guess because these people are all struggling with addiction, it has the problem that every addict story have, which is the repetition and the boredom. It's the same story. Like, how many times are we getting Koopsta out of jail, beating him up in the background? He's talking shit. We're talking shit. We're mad. He didn't make it on time. We get him to rehab. 
And then you multiply it by all the members of his record label. And then you multiply that by like, he's trying to talk about who's doing what numbers in terms of ticket sales and album sales. And these people are, what is it like Slackometer or Hitto Slacks or whatever? Selecto hit. Selecto hit. So they officially kick Coops out of the group. He's gone because he's too much bullshit. Once again, he is bought out. And this book is so repetitive. He says like three or four times. And years later, he said on an interview that I did right by him and I bought him out and I gave him all the money he was entitled to. And he's like, thank you for like setting the record straight. Juicy J seems very put upon that his good name has ever been besmirched. He thinks he's always been good to everybody except for the people he tried to kill. And I think he has a list of names. And I do think that this is something that celebrities struggle with, not just Juicy J, but like almost all celebrities. And if you write a memoir, it means you want people to think of you a certain way. So any memoir writing celebrity wants to be perceived a certain way. And I think you look at someone like Taylor Swift, when you want to be perceived of as good and you want to be successful, sometimes you can't have it all. Sometimes the fact that you are the last man standing in 3-6 Mafia, that you are the one that is still making music with Mike Will Made It and Miley Cyrus. and Like like you want people to think you are the hardest working and you have the best ear while you are a lot more famous than everybody else and a lot richer. Yeah, sometimes you just have to take the success for what it is. People are going to hate that about you. Yeah, and some of the other ones did pretty well. I think DJ Paul did really well, but he's not Juicy J. He's somebody's uncle. <laughs> the worst thing a man can be. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not getting a lot of radio play but they are going crazy in the clubs everyone is obsessed with them they're really kind of revolutionizing sound anything could happen in the studio we were bringing guitar players horn players violinists piano players opera singers if it was make our songs better we would try it they miked two people having sex in the studio and put that in the background of a song he's like i used to breathe heavy and say i'll kill you in the phone and it was very effective at scaring people. So I put that on a track, too. I was down to try anything. I was like, okay. He thinks Project Pat is like it. He thinks he's the most talented guy in the world. So he starts working on an album with Project Pat. And he's like, he has such a unique sound. People are going to hear it and go, oh, that is Project Pat. So they start working on a record together. And Hypnotized Minds has just a that's their record label now because when they broke up with that silent guy, he ended up getting the name Profit Entertainment. So now they're called Hypnotized Minds, by the way. And they have a great roster with hypnotized minds. He also says, I felt like I had a split personality, a fuck it side and a fear side. It was a real fight to control my mind. The war going on in my mind saved my life. I knew I had too much to lose to keep doing dumb shit in the streets. And again, I think because it's illegal, a lot of the dumb shit he does in the streets is not in this book. I think around this point, though, is when the success starts changing his relationships. He talks about wanting to buy his mom a house and he wants to buy her house in kind of like a safer white suburb and she won't go because of the racism she experienced growing up. She's like, I don't trust that neighborhood. I don't trust those people. His brother keeps getting out of jail. And even though Juicy J wants him to like put out a new album, like start making money, like do it the music way instead of the street way. It's so important to Project Pat not to be seen as a phony. And so he's like always going out with a gun. And Juicy's like, stay off the streets. Just like, why? You're going to end up in jail. And of course, he always does. But Project Pat, I think, really sees Juicy as like a fake for talking about stuff he's not really living. And it's really important to Pat that he's like living it. And Juicy keeps being like, you did it already. You don't have to prove anything to these people. You just got out of jail. But it was already inside him. Yeah. So then Relativity gets absorbed by Loud. So they end up with new a &R guys, and they lose the people that were really within the label system helping them. No one else really believed in them or understood them in the same way. Looking back with Relativity, that was the best team of people I'd ever worked with in a major label system. Cliff and Alan were my favorites. Being at Loud was a different experience. I liked that Loud had more of a hood vibe and that you could smoke weed in their office. But they were trying to force them to do something that they didn't want to be. And also the two major executives with Loud hated each other. And so one of them would say, do one thing. And the other one would say, don't do what that guy said to do. And he was like, what the fuck are we supposed to do? This is crazy, actually. <laughs> and then they come up with When the Smoke Clears 6661. Specifically, they came up with the song Sippin' on Some Syrup. The reason DJ Paul and I are the only 3-6 Mafia members on the song was because nobody else showed up to the studio. Not Lord Infamous, not Gangsta Boo, not Crunchy Black. All three of them were supposed to be on sipping on some syrup, but they weren't answering their phones. That's why Paul and I decided to put Pimp C and Bun B on it. We know them for years, so it was a perfect opportunity to collaborate. Basically, he was like, we were at the point where we we're like, if you don't show up, you're not on the song. Of course, this song then goes platinum. It's like the biggest song they ever do. They put out all these remixes of it. It blows up. It was the most popular song of their career. It's also when they started getting crossover appeal. Up until then, their audiences had only been black, really. 
And for the first time, they had like white people showing up to their concerts. Yeah. While some crews were blowing money, 3-6 Mafia was trying to save it. Project Pat puts out a single called Chicken Head and it starts to take off and he gets, you know, invited to do the Jerry Jones show in Chicago. But then September 11th happens. And of course, September 11th is important because he gets too scared to fly on a plane for the next several years. You know what they say, you're safer in a car with a bunch of people on cocaine than you are on 9-11. <laughs> I still wonder statistically, like, how many car accidents were on 9-11? I guess a lot of planes went down that day, but still, I bet more than three cars crashed. Impossible to prove. You had two in the towers, one in the pent, a gone. And one in the field. <laughs> two in the towers, one in the field. <laughs> like the old saying goes. The shocker. <laughs> It was shocking. 9-11 was shocking, to say the least. <laughs> but there had to have been more than four car crashes, especially on cocaine people. You think four planes is only four cars worth of people? No, but I still think it's a per vehicle Oh, thing. statistically. I still think to me, it's like what percentage of planes that flew that day went down versus what percentage of cars that drove that day went down. Totally. Great question for the statisticians out there. Just something to think about. So then Project Pat is getting ready to put out his next album when he gets arrested again. He violated his parole and was put in jail for four years. And they try to keep it a secret so that they can still put his album out and promote it. They get a stand-in to make a music video for his song. And he's just pissed at his brother. He's like, I can't believe you left. You were going to have a huge tour. Things were going to go huge for you. I feel like he had paid money towards the tour. I think like money was lost. Yeah. It's not just like opportunity cost. Money had been put down. Yeah. They were getting ready to roll out this album and they had to change everything. And then also four years away, that's valuable hype building time. At the same time, Boo is about to put out an album and she keeps like talking about how her album's going to be the best. And I will say, I think it was a bit biased, but Project Pat had his own brother on his, like, you know what I mean? Juicy J was more on Project Pat's side than Booze was. And Project Pat's album ends up doing more than Gangsta Booze does. And then she kind of like freaks out and they have to break up again. Although Boo was a key piece of 36 Mafia, she wasn't the main piece. Gradually, Paul and I realized that we didn't need Gangsta Boo, that she was more trouble than she was worth. We tried to work with her, but she didn't want to work with us. And we still had the chat. Basically, he was like, we still have a girl. We don't need this other girl. As was the case with Koopsta and Nick Jackson, the money was straight with Boo. Everything was being taken care of, even though she accused Paul and me of stealing her money. Later, she apologized and admitted that she had been properly paid. She even laughed about it. Ha ha ha. 3-6 Mafia was now down to four members. DJ Paul, Lord Infamous, Crunchy Black, and me. I felt 3-6 Mafia got stronger after Gangsta Boo's departure and everyone was on the same page. No matter what would happen in my life, I'd always tell myself, I don't give a fuck what happens. I'm going to come out on top. I think overall, he feels really hurt that he tried so hard to keep this entire group on point and they would all just like fight him on making money as a group. Yeah. Like I think that is really hard to be like, I'm literally begging you to show up to make a best-selling record. Can you just come? Can you just come and like spend half an hour in the studio so that we can put this thing out? Also, I mean, three members of the group end up dying from drug-related problems. Like, yeah, you cannot save somebody from their addiction. Since the beginning of 3-6 Mafia, I'd been telling everyone, if you don't do it, someone else will. Our crew started to see how real of a statement that was. They were living it. They'd hate when I'd get them up early in the morning to do a radio station. You're just kissing those white folks' asses. I heard they'd say about me, it's our label, our music, our money. And I'd think to myself, it's hypnotized mind and Columbia is backing it and they're putting up big money. Basically, he's saying like, if we don't show up to promote, if we don't show up to put our music out there, like people are catching up. People are going to make this type of music. People are going to do the radio. Like someone is going to promote a record. So we should want it to be ours. Mm -hmm. As much as I wanted to focus on music, I couldn't. I had a family issue that I had to deal with. So his dad is also a gambling addict. He didn't know until just now. He just found out because Project Pat is in jail and realizes that he like has no money. And he's like, why do I have no money? And it's because their dad who had co-signed on their bank accounts had just been stealing money. More than 70000 from Pat's account. I couldn't believe it. Then I thought about my account. I looked and saw my dad had taken about the same amount from my account. We had kept our father on our accounts in case we needed him to help us handle business. But when I looked, my father had taken 2500 here, $10,000 there. I didn't even want to add it up because the more I added, the more upset I was getting. Man, first an adulterer and now a thief. And also he has so much money. He's like, if my dad had just asked me, I would have given him a lot of money. And that's what hurts him the most. He keeps being like, I have done everything I can to like keep my family okay. Even now, he's like, I give out anybody in my family as much money as I can all the time. The idea that they would take from me is so painful. So that puts another rift in the trust with his dad. 
He then looks out and sees that Master P had shocked the rap game. He had done his own straight to VHS movie called I'm About It, and it had been like a huge success. So they just make a movie. He like calls some people. He makes two. He does I Got the Hookup and Choices. And it catches the eye of John Singleton. This had kind of put them on an even bigger stage. Putting out these movies really blasted their music out even further. They're also, now that they're down to three, appearing as guests on other people's singles quite often and doing so to a lot of success. They're on Go to Sleep, on Ludacris's album. I feel like they're really doing a great job of mixing and mingling with the rap community. So Columbia Records, though, is not doing a good job pushing them. They're pushing themselves. They are really disappointed with the way the record label is treating them. The group is having a hard time. But he himself is coming out and starting to do, like, beats for other people. But the group is, there's, like, major rifts. They, first of all, aren't happy with the way their records are performing. But second of all, like, especially in compared to the way that they've set the record label up to blast them out, they made these movies. They're doing all of this great stuff, and the record label is kind of just, like, expecting them to promote themselves, even though, as we know, they get a lot of money to promote a record. Like the record label takes a percentage because they're supposedly promoting you. So he also is getting madder and madder at the group who is still doing a ton of drugs and still breaking a lot of laws. And he's like, I won't be in a car with them anymore because if I get caught in a car with them and go to jail, like that is not how I want to go down. So he starts driving himself separately. They hate that about him. Things are going really bad with Lord Infamous. He will not get off drugs. He's doing too many drugs. In 2004, Lord Infamous leaves the group. He just stops showing up and they're like, okay, bye. And like they heard it from somebody else. They were in New York City and just out of nowhere, he just doesn't show up one day. Then they put out Stay Fly and it pops off. It becomes an anthem, one of our biggest songs with more than 2 million master tones. Do you guys remember that when you could buy playbacks on your cell phones? Yeah. So if you're like literally any younger than me, I think you wouldn't know this, but there was a time where you could buy a ringback tone and when somebody calls you, you'd hear a song. It was amazing. They make Stay Fly and they had to hustle to put the rest of the album together because that song is doing so well that they need an album to put out with it. Oh my God, they put out Pop in My Collar on that album. It's called Most Known Unknown. But the problem is they're doing so well that they have to start doing more appearances, which forces them to go back into the skies. They have to start flying again and he's so scared because of 9-11 that he starts taking Xanax. And as we know, that is not a good road. I usually took them on the low. I wanted to find a way to enjoy our success. And as foolish as it was, this is a way I could do it. So around this time, John Singleton, who had come and seen them on the set of Choices, is making a movie called Baby Boy, which we know from Taraji P. Henson's movie. Taraji P. Henson's movie that we know from her book. (laughs) And then he makes another movie called Hustle and Flow. And he calls them again to do all of the music. So they put a song in Baby Boy. And then he calls them to do all the music for Hustle and Flow. And they come up with It's Hard Out There for a Pimp. And this movie is low budget. John Singleton puts a lot of his own money towards it. And then one day they get a call from John that they're nominated for an Oscar. And how did the song even come together? We didn't have a beat or anything. We just said It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp. And then the song came together pretty naturally. I watched the performance of it when they performed at the Oscars with Taraji. Cool. After we performed, we felt like we'd already won. Three Six Mafia had performed at the Oscars. That was beyond our comprehension. Winning the Oscar ended up being one of the best and most painful experiences of my life. So I guess people were not as congratulatory as he thought they would be. So Ashley did some research on this. I kind of want to talk to a music person about this and ask what was going on because this is definitely being told through Juicy J's perspective. And I need a reality check on where this perspective actually fits within the reality. So they get off stage where they've just won their Oscar and they're like over the moon. And Gail King says, I guess it's a sad day. I was smiling, happy to be there and basking in the moment, so I didn't know what she was talking about. She was saying that 3-6 Mafia winning an Oscar was a sad day. It was so awkward, but then she just started the interview as if she hadn't just said that. I was focused on answering her question, so I didn't ask her what she meant. And then they saw Will Smith. He wasn't happy for us. I'm just upset that y'all got one before me, he told me. On one hand, I wonder if Will Smith was like half joking, but on the other hand, if he wasn't joking, it was because he's a narcissist who was like, how did you get one before me? And then he says they go to this party. John Singleton pulled me to the side. You feel the hate, he asked me. It was just so crazy that John felt it too. This isn't totally true, of course, but it seemed like all the black folk were hating on us and all the white people were happy for us. It was the weirdest shit I'd ever seen in my life. I guess I think it was a room full of mostly white folks. The shit was Hollywood as fuck. So that's what I would love to like know what the reception of the movie was. Like, I just want to know if he's a sensitive boy. He kind of seems sensitive. I think he's sensitive. He's kind of like... Everybody needs to be happy for me, even the people I broke up with. They all need to acknowledge that I like won fair and square. So I am curious of if there was a backlash or if 
he invented a backlash. Yeah. I don't know because I Googled a lot of things to try to find out if there was like a problem with 3-6 Mafia and I couldn't really find one other than like them suing each other. After we won that Oscar, everybody wanted to hang out with the Oscar winners. Sure, we could have gone back to Memphis and worked, but you only live once. We wanted to live this experience to the fullest. So they start going to crazy parties. They go to Playboy Mansion parties, Paris Hilton's house. Paris invited Paul and me to the club, and I met Serena Williams and Kim Kardashian. And two months later, I started dating Serena. Paul and I were drunk and high all the time, spending all of our time at a strip club, every bar. Overnight, 3-6 Mafia had gone from doing underground shows to partying with Quentin Tarantino and George Clooney. He goes, I was in the middle of the best time of my life, but all wasn't right. 3-6 Mafia was more famous than we could ever have imagined, but we lost focus. Hollywood was beautiful, and we had more money than we knew what to do with. Doctors start coming out of the woodwork and being like, whatever you want, whatever you need, we can get it for you. I'd be at parties, and people would be walking around with flavored cocaine. I saw it, but I didn't think to try it. There were other issues, too. Even though I thought we talked it out, my father took more money from me. Every time we went to Memphis, we hurried back to Los Angeles as fast as we possibly could. We loved Memphis, but we were over it. My vision of myself in Memphis wasn't a good one. I was too worried about getting caught up in some street shit and needing to shoot someone. I saw more hate. LA was more our speed at the time. We were enamored with parties and drugs and A-list celebrity lifestyle. So now that he's doing a lot of drugs, he is addicted to them. He needs them to get on stage. He needs them to record. And emotionally, he's feeling empty. Crunchy Black also, like, immediately after the Oscars win, is like, I actually want to leave. He also is struggling with drugs. And they're about to send out to a reality show. And he just kind of is like, I have to get out of here. And he just, like, one day doesn't show up. So now they're down to two members, DJ Paul and me. I remember thinking we didn't need Crunchy Black, that he was the weakest link of 3-6 Mafia. Project Pat was in the studio with me the morning I found out Crunchy Black had left. I told Pat that I wanted him to be in the group. Nah, I can't do that, Project Pat said to me. I was in disbelief. Pat's mental peace meant more to him than getting a big payday. I think Pat is like a motivational speaker now. Interesting. He says me and DJ Paul are now in a different place. Juicy J had built this $2 million mansion in Memphis, the ground up, and he wouldn't even go in it. In addition to being drunk on alcohol and high on drugs, I was drunk on power I thought I had. Every time I got off stage, I was angry. I told my lawyer that if anyone wanted us to do anything, it would cost 250 grand and up. Charge the shit out of people, I told him. And then he finds out his lawyer is like really mean and crazy. So he fires his lawyer because he's like, okay, I want to charge people a fuck ton of money, but don't like yell at them if they say no. But then he also regrets firing him because he was like, he was one of the few people on my team that was like telling me no. So I'm like, I don't, it sounds like he would just said no. Yeah. It sounds like that was his job. Then people started trying to put us with pop producers telling us how to make songs. DJ Paul and I were losing our ear, our connection to the streets that enabled us to stay on top. The label was trying to push us to be more like the Black Eyed Peas. Since we'd won an Oscar, Columbia was looking at us like pop stars. This is one of the most astute lines about music I've ever heard in my entire life. Please prepare yourselves, buckle your seatbelts. What labels don't understand is that not all groups have to make pop records to go pop. I found that so interesting because it's so true. And I mean interesting in the way that I mean interesting, not in the way that we overuse the word interesting. There is obviously a distinct sound that is classic bubblegum pop, right? Bottled on the nose record label pop. But other things become popular music. And the things that like go the hardest are the things that are unexpected that aren't just like canned whatever bullshit late stage Katy Perry crap. They're not just like Megan Don't Trainor. say that. He's about to collab with Katy Perry. And it's That's why I said l- of his late stage okay, Katy Perry. Enough. You guys know I think Katy Perry is one of the greatest nosedives in music. Anyway, I think that the way that labels do exist by this principle that we have to make everything be the same for it to be pop. Classic 3-6 Mafia can be popular music. Anything can be popular if people like it. You don't have to make it be the same as everything else. The best music is taking something different and like letting it find its groove. So anyway, things are going bad. Um, He's noticing a lot of cocaine in the group again. I don't know if he's implicating DJ Paul, but he's like, there was a lot of cocaine around. I mean, the group is just him and DJ Paul. Paul and I weren't on the same page. Paul and I had never really had an argument since we started making music together. We'd been on the same page our whole lives. But now we'd won an Oscar and we were living in LA. And then we started disagreeing a lot, having small arguments. Shit changed. At some point, a gun was shot. He goes, read his book to understand what happened. And I was like, "Um, I already paid for your book. Tell me what happened. You were there. He was thinking about retiring in 2006. He was discouraged and worried. He was like, maybe I'll just start a record label and go to sleep. (laughs) They put out a final album, Last to Walk, and it nosedives. It was the worst of their releases. Cocaine is one of the main reasons why 3-6 Mafia isn't together today. The drug usage broke up the group and really fucked up everything. Cocaine is the devil, the anarchist. It's a different type of monster. 
He also is talking about how he has no sense of who they are anymore and no sense of what's going on musically. Pat was back in Memphis and had found all these artists. He would be at my house telling me I needed to put out some mixtapes. I told him, I don't give away nothing for free. I sell music. He told me to go online and listen to Gucci Mane to the new artist. He'd tell me, man, y'all ain't hot. Nobody's playing 3-6 Mafia in the South. I live in Memphis. You live in LA. You don't know what's going on in the South. At this point in all lives, Pat was the only person who could put me in check. Just like I was the only person who could put him in check. I was really out of touch. I was drunk. I was high on pills. My syrup and Xanax vibe had kicked in. And then he discovers California weed. And he's like, that was actually really awesome. I love California weed. It puts me on my flow. It's the first time he realized how anxious he was when he's not high. <laughs> it's about to be like, oh my God, finally, the drug I've been looking for. Yeah. But listen, weed is natural. It's from the earth, baby. I felt like shit was falling apart, but I was getting into a bunch of things trying to make something happen. I got with the band and started managing them. I tried keeping 3-6 Mafia together. I tried acting. I even tried to model. I still had energy. I wasn't done yet, but nothing I tried worked. And so he starts managing other bands through a new label. He names after his grandma, D. Brady Entertainment. And then he decides to go back to Memphis. And this is where he gets his boots back in the dirt. When he goes to Memphis, he understands that he needs to be working in mixtapes again. He needs to reconnect with the artistry of what he was doing and the passion and the joy. And that's when he first starts rapping over other people's beats. He had only ever made beats for himself or with DJ Paul. But now he's hearing some beats and going, okay, maybe I should rap over someone else's beats. Times were changing and I had to deal with new producers. I knew that there was a newer wave and I wanted to be a part of it. He hears Drama Boy's beats and he's like, wow, yours are better than mine. And it really starts pushing him. Some people feel forced to do something different. They think they've got to do certain things from being relevant. I didn't. I love Drama Boy's beats and the beats from other producers I worked with. So he starts working with them. My eyes and ears were now open to everything. One thing that really helped me is that I'm a producer. I'm not afraid to say that doesn't sound good. I don't get offended if somebody doesn't like my music. I'm listening to their feedback. Yes, I'm an artist, but I'm also a producer, which is such an interesting distinction. So he gets back in the studio and starts making mixtapes. He starts reconnecting with other artists that he really respects. He becomes really good friends with Wiz Khalifa via Twitter. And Wiz was starting Taylor Gang. So he sits down with Wiz and helps him with the business stuff. And then I didn't realize he is kind of a silent partner in Taylor Gang. When you're like, how much money is he worth? A lot. So he starts like really working on music. He's with Columbia Records. They want a new 3-6 Mafia album. And he's like, well, what about a solo album? And they're like, that sounds great. And then when he calls them back later to talk about the solo album, they just stop answering his calls. So now he's like, fuck, I got nobody. He realizes he has depression. I was depressed about 3-6 Mafia. It was something that I helped create and I wanted it to go all the way to the top. No one had the same goals as I did and the group was done. I was doing solo stuff, but I never set out to be a solo artist. I hadn't realized until that moment, but I was mad and depressed that the group wasn't together and that it never would or could be again. While I was making a name for myself and by myself, I was in a really bad space. I mean, I do think that he seems probably kind of hard to work with and probably condescending. He's got real Jason Derulo to him. Like a real know-it-all. Jason Derulo. I guess I think that Jason Derulo is still just a pop machine. And I think that Juicy J is an artist, but he like operates on a different wavelength than other people and doesn't understand why they won't also do that. Like, he's not eating salmon juice and doing backflips on concrete. Can you never say that to me again? I just threw up in my mouth. I forgot. Salmon juice. <laughs> Upsetting stuff. I think that probably the other people are like, the truth of this is that we have to be in the streets shooting guns and doing cocaine. And the fact that Juicy J is like, no, you don't. They're like, well, actually, fuck you then. He's like out on tour and he makes a song off the cuff to Bands Make Her Dance with a Mike Will made it beat. It's obviously great. It got hot and Lil Wayne reached out to Wiz Khalifa to get in touch with me. He puts a verse on it. 2 Chains puts a verse on it. He's just like putting it out online and it's blowing up. And Columbia Records called my lawyer, Joe Carlone. They said they were calling about this guy, Juicy J, and that they wanted to sign me. You fucking dumbasses, my lawyer told them. You already have Juicy J under contract. Juicy J's in the 3-6 Mafia. They were like, oh, really? So then Columbia's like cease and desist, stop putting this music out. We own it. I was about to make a critical decision when I knew it would make or break my career. So he hates Columbia Records because he wanted to be in an office at Columbia Records. He wanted to be the head of the record label. He's like, I told you about The Weeknd and now The Weeknd is making you a fuck ton of money. Like, he personally paid for a $60,000 music video with The Weeknd because he's like, this guy's really good. And they're like, we've never heard of him. We think he sucks. And they'd be like, yeah, you got a good ear. You should uh, do something with it for us. And he's like, no, I'll run the company or not. And they were like, not, not <laughs> Ben. <laughs> so they end up putting him on Dr. Luke's imprint, I guess, on Columbia Records. Because he's like, I'll work with Dr. Luke, but I fucking hate you guys. And so they put him on Kimo Sabi and he puts out the album Stay Trippy in 2013. Bands Maker Dance went platinum and it would have been even bigger. 
because Andre 3000 wanted to put a verse on it. And then Beyonce said, well, if Andre puts a verse on it, I'll put a verse on it. I don't even know why he told us this story. What do you mean it would have been even bigger if so? Yeah, and it would have been even bigger if it had become the national anthem and it would have been even bigger (laughs) if, you know what I mean, if Taylor Swift was on it. Because this is his personality. He needs you to know that he is not only good, but the best and could have been even bester. If the bestest had been engaged. Yeah. I was doing a song for one of the biggest pop stars in the world. So he makes a song with Miley Cyrus. And I would have been president if I had run and won. And that would have been pretty big for the podcast, I think. (laughs) If I could have linked it in every White House newsletter to the people of America. What if you made it a law that people had to listen to CNBC and could only leave five-star reviews? (laughs) (laughs) Ah, They were right to call us fascists. (laughs) But there would be universal health care. Yeah. And no more cars. Who's the fascist now, bitch? (laughs) Everyone walks to the ER where they're treated immediately for free. (laughs) Ambulances are just those old timey things they use to carry around pharaohs. 18 month maternity leave and free pre-K. But your baby can't be in a stroller. It's too car like. (laughs) (laughs) So then he's making a song with Katy Perry. And he's really proud of himself for like staying true to himself, even though he's making music with Dr. Luke and Katy Perry. The song is huge. They perform it at Coachella. He's so famous. He's on 23 with Miley Cyrus. Arguably her worst song. (laughs) That's not his fault, though. That's because she wore that Michael Jordan diaper, and I found it disrespectful. I think the the song was bad because the song was bad. Totally. Project Pat would always remind me, this is your dream. I was finally living it. I mean, his dream was to just be, like, stupid rich and famous. I'd call family members and be like, you want some money? How much you want? 30 grand? 40 grand? I would call people and give money away. I was riding high, but a crush was right around the corner. So the rest of 3-6 Mafia gets back together and makes a band called The Mafia 6. <laughs> Paul was upset because he said he would do a verse on it on their new album. And then he actually was like, never mind. I'm doing so well without you guys. They're pissed at him. He's like, I get it. I get it. I was doing really good. As much as I love the group, I couldn't put myself in that position. Not when things were going better than ever. He was like, they were all 40 years old and doing so much cocaine. I didn't want to be around it. And then he gets the call that Lord Infamous passes away. He had been using a patch to help him get off the heroin, but he like overdosed on the patch. This like really sends him spiraling. He's like, what could I have done to have helped him? I tried so hard, but what if I had said it one more time? And he's like, but I had to get back to work. I had to do shell shock for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the movie. Especially because they didn't even call him. He found out from like the news And he calls Paul and he's like, why didn't you tell me that Lord Infamous died? And he's like, well, I thought you'd be too busy. And that really hurts him. The run I was on was bigger than 3-6 Mafia. Like Wiz, I was on the Furious 7 soundtrack. I collaborated with Kevin Gates, Future. That's another weird thing. He goes on and on about how huge See You Again is on the Fast and Furious soundtrack for Wiz Khalifa. And I was like, oh, was he on that song? He's like, I wasn't on that song, but I was on the album. And I was like, okay. When he doesn't fuck with someone, he will leave their name in the dirt. But when he does fuck with someone, he wrote like 20 pages about how much he admires Wiz Khalifa. There's like an entire chapter here about what a genius logic is. So from going back to Memphis and getting his boots back in the mixtape grind, he feels like he got his musical energy back. And now he can stay in L.A. where he isn't as susceptible to kind of the energy that brings him down. He has a lot of love for Memphis, but he's also like, it's an evil place and I hate it there. And then Koopsta dies. To me, he was like a rat. He ran his mouth a lot. He was a nut, an idiot. Rest in peace to the man, but he didn't have a mind. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) He was a real crazy dude who would do anything. You might be out enjoying dinner with your girl, and all of a sudden he pulls out a gun and starts shooting up the place. Some of my friendships were ending because of beefs and deaths. I was experiencing the most important change of my life. He also was fighting with Gangsta Boo at this point, but then when his career like blew up, all of their back catalog blew up and she was getting paid out because of that. So he's like, how mad could you be? It's like, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, even if the goose left the gander. And the craziest change of his life, what could that have been? It was that he decided to get a wife. That's so funny you say that because actually the first sentence of this chapter is when Drake called me up. <laughs> <laughs> but through Drake, he actually meets this girl who is so pretty, but more than being pretty, she's actually smarter than the other girls. She's not like other girls. She's a dental hygienist. And if she wasn't smart, how could she be studying to be a dental hygienist? <laughs> she was very professional. That's such a funny adjective to use a woman that you met at a bowling alley birthday party for Drake. Like he was at a bowling party that Drake was throwing. And he was like, who's the most professional lady here? I love that she's wearing business casual at this bowling party and her dental eyeglasses. 
this is where I got really mad at him because I like that he loves Regina, but I hate the way he talks about her because she's not the only woman who is worth not fucking and leaving in a garbage can. Yeah, but he didn't know it till he was 45. So he is 37 and she's 23 when, when they, they meet met. and they start dating for a few months and then they break up. And then like 10 years later, he calls her up. He's like, you still waiting? Get out here. I'm so fucking sick of men fucking around for decades and then being like, I have to marry a 22 year old because otherwise they'll be as run through as these other bitches I've been treating like shit. Also to be like, finally, a smart woman. I don't know if the other women were smart. I never spoke to one, but I had someone I wanted to be with. I was thinking about life, not just business. How nice. Then they get married in 2015. In 2018, they have daughter. 2020, they have a son. As a mother, Regina really stepped her game up. <laughs> She's got them in all the activities. Having children is like I've done a 180 degree turn with my career. I used to wake up, get high, make music, travel. I knew I had to slow it down when my wife had our daughter. Soon after we brought Kamai home from the hospital, she woke up in the middle of the night and was crying. Regina woke me up and told me to go get Kamai. That was a shock to my system. I was so used to just getting up whenever I felt like it, drinking whenever I wanted and not having to think about anyone else. That was a big adjustment for me. Real life had just kicked in. But he like loves them so much. He's like, I want to be with them. I've stopped touring. I'm like trying to make back end money now so I can be with them. He does have this line that really got me. Taking Kamai and Miles to school is a highlight of my day every day. Making sure that the kids are eating right, staying healthy, getting their checkups and brushing their teeth is so important to me. I want to be there for my children like my parents were there for me. That one really got me because I feel like normally dads are like, I want to be there for their high school graduate. Like, but brushing teeth really is that's some like parent shit. After dealing with so much bullshit throughout my life, I knew that the next phase of my life was going to be the most important. The hustle continues. Getting married and becoming a father didn't slow me down. My career kept growing. He like is now just the king of cutting a sample. Everyone is sampling all of his music. My lawyer told me that if a show comes along that makes sense, then do it. Other than that, I should just stay home, make beats, chill, and enjoy my kids. And I've been doing that and enjoying watching them grow up. He talks about all the people he's been working with, the artists he respects. No disrespect to anyone else, but Lil Wayne is the best rapper alive. He talks about doing verses and how much money they had to pay him to make it worth his time. And he was really pissed that Swiss Beats and Timbaland like, were giving him a little bit of money. And they were like, it'll help your back catalog. And he's like, yeah, I'm cutting like two to three samples a day. And they're like, oh, okay. I guess they thought he was broke and he did not appreciate that. He lives in Vegas now with his wife and his kids. Yeah, because it's like cheaper and chiller than L.A. His mom gets sick and that is really hard for him. He spends a lot of time with her, but she decides to stop doing chemo just because it was too hard on her body. My mom took a lot of pain to the grave with her. She had been scarred by racism growing up and throughout her life. I don't think she ever got over her father never telling her that he loved her. His mom's dad so his grandpa had two families and all the kids had the same names so that he could keep them straight he also starts going to therapy yeah that was big for him he starts talking to three six mafia again but mostly only about business he just really doesn't get along with anyone gangsta boo passes away he talks to her a little bit before she dies but he wasn't really there it was really hard for him to like be around them especially when they were all still doing so much drugs and he says, you know, whatever they said about me, I was always there for them. I was always trying to get them off the drugs till the end. I was willing to pay for them to go to rehab and taking them. But he's like, I still regret that maybe if I had just said it one more time, maybe if I tried it once more, it would have made a difference. Yeah. I'm making a point of being around the people that I love, whether it's my family or my friends like Wiz Khalifa, Crazy Mike and my security. <laughs> yes, we work together, but we also just sit around and talk about life. He really is in his earnest era. <laughs> I'm always trying to learn to do things differently. Right now, I'm taking piano lessons. Although I've always been able to peck on the keys, I was never a trained piano player. Since I was never a Liberace type of dude, I want to get to that level. I want to be able to put a piano on stage and go crazy with it. I still feel like I'm growing musically and personally and that my music is getting better. He does this fascinating thing where he does not listen to the radio in Los Angeles. That's the only way he can live there. He's like, I exclusively listen to mixtapes made by the artists coming out of Memphis so that I stay in tune with like, what the youth is doing, what like, the real music and they're doing for real. And he's like, nobody's allowed to have on the L.A. radio around me. Yeah, he says it burns his ears out. Making music is a challenge that I'm amped about because I know I get to create something crazy. I always send people heat. Everybody should take care of their mental health. It's very important. It took me a long time to realize that. It started from some of the trauma I experienced in my home and growing up in Memphis, and it went from there. In the next stage of my life, I'm going to try to do things to help the community. Everybody should take care of their mental health. It's very important. He's also like, in order to get good, like logic, you have to just work hard. And he's like really interested in working hard. And he's like, you can't work hard if you're doing a ton of drugs. Yeah. He also invested in core hydration, which I, he made a ton of money off of that. 
I don't know why he had to tell us that. Yeah, I mean, he has like a couple paragraphs about all of his great investments. And then he goes, you know, when I look back, I guess I did make a Stax Records. I did a Memphis label of all Memphis musicians. And it changed music forever. He also thinks that uh, racism might end pretty soon. I hope so. 20 or 30 years, he's thinking. Especially in the next 20 or 30 years. <laughs> More white people are dating black people. Black people are dating Asian people. That'll break it down. Even with all the strife in 3-6 Mafia, we still made money, music, and even won an Oscar. That is crazy that they won an Oscar. Can I say, he's like, I thought that we'd have a new MLK, a new Dr. King has come along. That hasn't happened. Other leaders have come up and are still emerging, but the change has been small compared to what our country achieved during Dr. King's time. Yet, in our own way, 3-6 Mafia helped make a change. <laughs> Some have said that there's been no Martin Luther King since. Except for 3-6 Mafia. And he goes, how did we change the game? When we did our reality show, everyone said we sold out. But now everybody wants to have a reality show. We are the princes and the Michael Jacksons of our era. It's a blessing to have had that kind of impact. As long as I keep making music and doing creative projects, I'm going to prove myself again and again. Looking back, I've been a superstar most of my life. You know, okay, so the thing is, he is really famous and rich. I, I, I didn't say he wasn't. I even said he was. I give all my glory to God. I'm thankful for everything I have and I don't ever want to give up. I don't ever want to stop making music or give up on my family. I want to keep going. I feel like there's more to do. I've proven myself over and over again. As long as I keep on making music and doing creative projects, I'm going to prove myself again and again. Claire, what did you think? I liked him. It was a little tedious and in the weeds, but overall... Listen, he takes a lot of accountability. I'm a sucker for a story of someone who wins an Oscar and then two years later is in like the parking lot of an Atlanta strip club passing out mixtapes for free and being their own street team. I have nothing but respect for people who take a look around and have to build shit back up. Yeah, and who are true to the mission, who know what they want to do, who are true to the art of it all. I like that about him. I wish him the best. I'm glad he's not out on the streets doing anything to the hose anymore. Yeah, me too. I don't know that he's so respectful of the hoes, but I guess he can't win them all. That's so true. On a scale of one to five, how fertile was this dirt? 3.75. Yeah. I think more if you're really interested in the history of 3-6 Mafia and Memphis. I also think if you were somebody who like wanted to make it, he does have such an, like the way that he pulls from books and the way he like studies and like built it and like kept at it. He's like a great blueprint role model for somebody who needs the push to believe in themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I would give it a 3.9. Beautiful. And how many warm teenies would you like with the man? I would honestly like to have like three. Yeah, me too. I would honestly get pretty fucked up with Juicy J. Me too. I would love to be in that little DJ booth at a club and like dance the night away. 3-6 Mafia. I'm on tour. Fucking the I'm fucking these whores. I would love to hear that song. I would love for him to like just keep putting on music of who he thinks is going to be the next big thing. Like, I would love to hear his favorites off of his latest listened to mixtapes. He should start an AM radio station. Juicy, I have an idea for you. I would tune in. Oh, my God. And we're so excited. If you guys missed it at the beginning, we are ending the Everybody But Bug tour. We will be off the road for the rest of the year besides Austin and the newly added Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, Columbus, Ohio, and Charlotte, North Carolina. We're so excited to see you guys there. Love you. Love you.